What is good, everybody? Welcome to the Gold Standard Podcast Network. I'm Rob Stats Guerrero, and here with me, as always, the one, the only, my good friend, Levin Black. What's up, Levin? Oh, good friend. Didn't know we we're gonna start things with tears. Yeah, make me cry. It's a new network. It's a new leaf. Okay, I'm just kidding. The the touchy feely time is over. You're still a human wet blanket. <laughs> That's all right. You're still a. Uh, I won't say it. Excellent. <laughs> Hooray for me. Uh, if you are new to the show, this is where you get the hot takes, mostly for me and the cold truth, mostly from Levin. Uh, just want to say really quickly, thank you to everybody that has reached out to me, to Michelle, to Levin. This community is awesome. And you have helped me navigate through what is, you know, a time of a lot of change. And I've gotten so many positive messages from people wondering where we went begging us to get something started so we're happy to be back on the gold standard podcast network and we are going to get things up and rolling because we're game away from the super bowl 11 <laughs> yeah which makes the timing all the more beautiful uh but if you're watching this on youtube because that is a new thing we're doing then uh good for you you get to see our ugly faces we're not Speak. just faceless voices anymore rob yeah, and maybe now no one will tell me I have a fat voice, whatever. That, I still don't know what that means, <laughs> but I haven't forgotten. I'll tell yeah, you that. People, people will see I'm only middle-aged. I'm not some 70-year-old <laughs> dude. I'm only half gray. <laughs> I'm, I fear for the future. Let me. Do, if this is what you're like now, I don't even want to know what you're going to be like then. But all I right. can introduce you to my father. It's pretty much a mirror image. That might have to happen on one episode. That's an off-season episode of the pod. It's just you and him, and we call it like black on black or something like that. Uh, have your mute button ready. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> well, we got a lot to get into because, like I said, NFC Championship game, stuff is happening with the 49ers. Unfortunately, there was some some bad news with Charles Amenahu uh, potentially being involved in a, some sort of domestic violence incident. He was arrested. He's out on bail. Um, Kyle Shanahan said yesterday that he is on track to play, assuming he can be healthy because he's also dealing with an oblique injury. I didn't really love how Kyle addressed it in the press conference. He was kind of like, yeah. he said like, oh, we're not going to kick him off the team. Like, I don't know that that's the right attitude you want to have right now. Well, he said we did our uh, investigation, looked into it the last 24, 48 hours. Well, hold on. Maybe not me, but our people did, which to me is a cop out. They all saying, say hey, don't that. Don't put it on me if this comes back to bite us in the butt, you know, and other people looked into it for us. But, I mean, if there was that much info out there, don't you think the cops would have made their choice? Because the police haven't. So how can the 49ers? I just, I didn't like his, I just felt like he could have said, like, we're going to let the legal process play out and we'll make our decision closer to game time like done then you just move on i just i didn't like the tone of like well we're not going to kick him off the team like i don't know i just didn't like it i just i mean he did phrase it in a way where it was we looked into it and we were confident in what we saw and that you know we're not going to kick him off the team basically saying we're confident that he didn't do anything which seems like a bold stance that's how i took it at least i i just don't like it like, you don't have to kick them off the team, but you can say you're not playing until this, you know, you're going to get paid, but you're not playing. That's the stance that should be happening. You know, it's no different than, you know, people with day jobs like myself. If I was accused of something like this and, you know, work found out, I would probably be suspended with pay until mm -hmm. they get all the details. And if it turns out I did something, they would fire me, pay would stop. If I did nothing and I'm found it to be innocent, I would come back to work. Like that, that's the normal way this is handled suspended with pay, basically. So now, and again, this is not the primary concern. This is the secondary concern. The primary concern is the safety of everybody involved, but this is a football show. And just looking at it purely from a football perspective, I'm almost wondering if between this incident and his health, do the Niners just make him inactive and go with Drake Jackson? That That's what I don't get. Like, if you look at it from the team aspect, which, uh, sorry, excuse me, huh? Uh, you right was, there? Yeah, All that right. was like a uh, dangerous burp. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what that is, but okay. 
I, I tasted the Snickers I ate before we recorded. Oh, dude. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyways, it's just like from a football standpoint, how important is he? Not that important. Has he been really good? Yeah, for what they paid to get him. I, I think people misconstrue that. Sometimes when you find like a diamond in the rough or, you know, in the bargain $5 bin or however you want to put it, you know, people are like, oh, this was great. No, it, it is great in terms of value, but it doesn't mean he's a great player. He had four and a half sacks in the year. He had half a sack in the final eight games of the regular season. He had a big wild card game. I'm not saying he's a bad player. He's just not a difference maker. And you have Drake Jackson there that's an inactive. So from a football standpoint, I don't know why the 49ers would take the risk. Because like- this could backfire. If it comes out, like say they go on to win the Super Bowl and then it comes out, oh, this guy was actually in the process of being charged with this terrible thing. Well, then that kind of sours it all. And that was my point on Twitter was like, one of the cool things about the Lynch Shanahan era is that they haven't really had almost, they've had almost no off field incidents. Whereas like the Harbaugh era, the last time they had a team that was this good, it was guys. I mean, Bruce Miller, Alden Smith, obviously Ray McDonald got in a bunch of trouble. Like there was always somebody it seemed like that was getting in, into trouble off the field. And, and that's largely not been an issue for the Shanahan Lynch team. So that's why I was kind of number one, disappointed that it happened. And number two, kind of disappointed in Kyle's response. Yeah. And that team, I think prioritized the value they brought to the football team over the legal yeah. matters. And that bothered a lot of people, including myself. So I'm happy that there hasn't been any of these big, stories in the last few years obviously the reuben foster stuff happened um but really haven't had much since then um but i just don't i don't like the idea of well we're going to pretend like he didn't do anything until proven otherwise i agree Uh, because it's just yeah it's they're saying whatever they want to say just so they could keep him on the field essentially and yeah we need to get past that as just the nfl in general just you got to stop doing stuff like that. They never will, but no. it'd be nice if they did. Um, all right. Let's look more at this game specifically. I was super confident going into the Cowboys game. Like I was no worries that they were going to win. I said I was as confident as I've ever been as a 49er fan. I do not feel that way <laughs> this week. I am nervous, Levin. I'm nervous about Jalen Hurts' deep passing. I'm nervous about the quarterback scrambles. I'm nervous about the Eagles defensive line. Can you help me feel better about anything? Uh, n- 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 not honestly. Uh, Gee, I do. Th- <laughs> it is what it is. Like, I do think the Eagles should be favored. If it was a Niners home game, uh, I could see the, the 49ers being favored. But I think this is truly two loaded teams about to square off against each other. You know, this is. The Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson, you know, it is true heavy heavyweights going at it at the peak of their games. It's a coin flip. Like this game could break so many different ways. There's so many like I could see a blowout for either team if they just they find the perfect thing and they come in with the perfect game plan or the other team makes mistakes with turnovers. And I can also see both teams winning, you know, a slugfest. I could see it being low scoring. I could see it being high scoring. Both teams are loaded on offense and loaded on defense. So it's just one of these games where it's kind of impossible to predict. The one thing that did raise my eyebrows a little bit, because you had a video on our YouTube channel, by the way, youtube.com slash stats on fire about the one player the 49ers should be worried about. And you said it was AJ Brown. And I'm looking at profootballtalk.com and AJ Brown kind of gave the old, I'm hurt, but I'm good. I'm good to go is what he would say. He didn't get into any more detail. He just had a lower body thing. He said, I'm good to go. That's all you need to know. Now, he's not on the Eagles practice report, so I guess he's fine. But between those comments and Jalen Hurts essentially saying, hey, I felt better, but you have to fight through it. You know, the Eagles might not be 100% healthy either. Neither team is. It's that point in the season where everybody's banged up, you know, it, that feels like a cliche thing to say, and I think a lot of people take it as cliche, but it is true. Like when you go to war this many times in a row, you have bruises 
that are left over from the previous week that don't fully get healed before you play again. And so then they just get worse again. And it's just a continual kind of slow decline into, all right, now I really do kind of hurt and I'm trying to, you know, will myself through these games. I think the Niners too. I mean, they're banged up with McCaffrey not practicing on Wednesday, Debo limited. Um, I think it speaks to the physicality of that Cowboys game. I mean, the Niners had not faced a defense like that in a while. And, you know, we talked all year about how nobody has won the week after they played the 49ers. Well, because the 49ers beat the tar out of you. And I think that the Niners got beat up a little bit last week. Yeah. And I mean, Shanahan flat admitted that, that they were able to go phys- physically with him because he was asked about that, that like, Oh, you know, every team's lost after you played them. They say that you're a physical team. Now you're going against the Eagles. Do you feel like maybe you finally found a, a you know, a fair matchup in that regard? And he said, we just went against the Cowboys, and that was a team that was able to go with us phys- physically. And I think that is true. We saw that. Now they might have worn down a little bit in the second half, but the Cowboys definitely came out with a game plan of, we need to be as physical as they are, not let them bully us. And the Eagles... They are a very physical team. Like they're going to be able to go toe to toe, but unlike the Cowboys, I don't think they they will wear down in the second half in that regard. So I do think it it, it is something that it's going to be equal. You know, and un, unfortunately, the Eagles just had a bye week, and then they played the Giants in a blowout. So, so two the Giants, bye weeks. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, that game was over pretty much in the midway through the second quarter. I think it was three possessions by that point. So the Eagles are definitely, I think ahead in that regard they've had time to rest what do you think of the head coaching matchup in this one because I'm a little nervous I think there's a chance that Sirianni out coaches Shanahan a little bit because he is aggressive he is going to go for it on fourth down he's going to keep the kicker on the sidelines in the red zone he's willing to do that stuff and this could be the kind of game where both teams are trying to grind it out offensively where both teams, the goal is run the ball, control the clock, and limit the possessions that the other team gets. And what I'm worried about is Kyle getting down to the red zone, having the drive stall out, and then he brings out Robbie Gold, acting like he's going to get three, four, five more possessions in the game, when in reality, the Eagles may take the air out of the ball and only limit the Niners to one or two possessions. So when you get down there, you got to get touchdowns, and Sirianni seems like he's willing to go for those, and Kyle isn't. If that were to happen, uh, this will be the one and only week of this network because Rob will have an aneurysm during the game. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he, he might be able to hit send on the text to me about it prior to, but uh, I don't think Rob survives the weekend if the 49ers lose a game because Kyle uh, saw yellow on fourth and two or whatever. The like, NFC Championship moment. game? Yes, yeah. I would have a stroke. No question <laughs> about it. They would be the I mean, end for me. It goes both ways. If you go for it on fourth down, statistically, you are more likely to win in in the obvious situations we're talking about, fourth and two, fourth and three. We're not talking fourth and 25 or something crazy like that. But you are statistically more likely to win when you go for those. But there is a decent, I mean, it's not like it's a, oh, you go 90% chance of win, a huge swing. No, it, it's, there's still a good chance that you don't succeed and thus you're, you're less likely to win when you fail. And so, I mean, that could backfire on Sirianni. Did you see Kyle's explanation for how he handled the end of the first half against the Cowboys? It like it literally made the vein in my forehead bulge. Because if you remember, the Niners got the ball back. It was first and 10 from the 30-yard line with a minute and 15 seconds left and two timeouts. And the score was tied at six. And Kyle starts to drive with two runs up the middle doesn't call timeout until there's like 30 seconds left after the second run. And Kyle's exact quote that he said earlier this week was, we liked where the score was at. We still think we have time to score, but when you get to a third and one and we had one timeout and they had two, we weren't about to not get that third down, punt it to them. Like his number one concern was not, getting points before the end of the half. His number one concern was not giving them the ball back. And in the game where you don't have the lead, that doesn't make any sense to me, Levin. Can you make that make sense? No, because the Cowboys were getting the ball first to start the second half on top of it. I think his fear was 
it's tied. If we waste the rest of this half, I know at worst it's a one possession game when we get our first possession in the second half. I think that was his full th thought process. He was too scared of the Cowboys being able to get the ball with 30 seconds, get a field goal, and then score a touchdown. Suddenly it's a 10-point game before the Niners even touch the ball in the second half. He was scared of that two-possession game, swinging things, destroying his ability to call plays because, you know, now all of a sudden he has to pass more. I think he was scared of that. He didn't want to go down big because he didn't want somebody like Michael Parsons getting the tee off. I think he was worried about that, but I don't agree with it. Like, you're not getting the ball to start the second half. It's a tie game. Go try to get points. That's I just don't understand why you would ever in a tie game voluntarily take you know your foot off the gas. And again, I, you know, it's not first and ten with no timeouts and thirty seconds left on your own five yard line. Like you're in good field position. You've got two timeouts. You've got time left on the clock. I don't understand why he lives in his fear like that. Like he always assumes the worst case scenario is going to happen. What if you go down the field and you score Kyle, and then you go into the locker room with a lead? Like, and again, I know that they did eventually score, but they almost scored in spite of Kyle Shanahan's strategy rather than because of it. And that just seems backwards to me. Yeah. And you can't even shame, uh, blame Jimmy Garoppolo for it. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> like that used to be the fallback. Well, Jimmy might turn it over. You know, th there's no argument now for that. And again, like, I'm not saying that this makes Kyle Shanahan a bad coach or anything like that. I'm just saying this is one specific thing that could come back to bite you in a game that ends up being close, especially if your possessions are going to be limited by the other team taking the air out of the ball. You know what this this is for him? It used to be Andy Reid couldn't make halftime adjustments, right? That used to be the MO. He would have these great game plans. They would have a great first half in the second half. It looked like they didn't adjust anything, and the defense started shutting them down. He finally solved that, and he wins his Super Bowl. Now, he solved it because he got a quarterback that solves it in Patrick <laughs> Mahomes. But he used to have this Achilles heel. Right now, Shanahan has this Achilles heel where he leaves points on the board because he's too scared to go for it. That seems so weird to me. Like, you have the great defense, so... What are you worried about? Just because you give them the ball back doesn't mean they're going to score anyway. I just, I, I really think he he needs to get out of that mindset of what if the worst case scenario happens? I feel like that's coaching not to lose instead of coaching to win. And it, it to me, it almost puts like a lot of meaning on the coin toss because I feel like he's way less likely to do that if the Niners get the ball first in the second half. If they do, I feel like he's way more aggressive. And we have seen... Brock Purdy be very, very good at the end of the second quarter, mm -hmm. scoring a touchdown with very little time left. I think he's done it four or five times since he's taken over. It's like if they if they don't get the ball first in the second half, it totally just messes with Kyle's head. I think the coin toss is actually going to be way more important this week. Right, and that gets into what I was saying, that he was scared of the Cowboys going up two possessions, whereas yes. if they get the ball to start, you know, to put it into words, what you're saying is, Worst case scenario, the Cowboys go get down, get points. The Niners are trailing going in the half, but then they get the ball, they score, they're right back in it. You know, and so he has kind of a fallback, if you want. He has that fallback of, hey, we get the ball first. The Cowboys at best get one possession, one possession. So we might as well go for it. it it's weird. It, it's like you, you're I, I don't know how to put that into words. Like it doesn't make sense. It's being almost hypocritical. Yeah, because if you assume you're gonna score when you get the ball first in the second half. Why don't you just assume you're going to score with the ball at the end of the first half? Yeah. He he is an aggressive coach, I think, play caller, most of the time. But it seems like he just clams up at the most crucial times yep. in the red zone, on short yardage, going forward on fourth down. I would love to, like, literally ask him about that. Like, I, it would take a lot for me not to just yell at him if I had the opportunity. <laughs> but, like, I really, he's not dumb. I'm sure he's thought about this stuff, you know? Like, he must have a method and a, and a reason for it. And maybe it's just, like, I know he's talked about it in the past, but his explanations just don't make sense to me. So I would love to, like, no. really just dig into that just to learn because, you know, there's going to be a lot of things the team does that I disagree with. They have more knowledge than I do. So that's just going to happen. But at least if I could understand the thinking and what went into that decision, I would feel a lot better about it. 
I think he's told us the truth and it makes sense. I just don't necessarily agree with that approach. He said that it depends on how he's feeling as a play caller uh, about his players in that game and all that about whether or not he goes for it. So basically he's trying to be this Nostradamus of, oh, well, we're, we're really moving the ball. We, we've got the, uh, uh, the defense's number, so we're going to be highly aggressive and go for it here, you know. You know what I mean? He tries, but then he also adjusts for game situations of, well, we're up, so I'm not going to risk it. You know, things like that. So there's no consistency. You're never going to have consistency because he's doing it based on his feel. And it's, you want to call it arrogance? Uh, I guess you could call it arrogance. It's his arrogance to think that he can, based on his feel, be right all the time. It's almost like the, gam- you know, the, the addicted gambler. Well, this is my time. I can feel it, you know. <laughs> I got a system. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. (laughs) Yeah, that just it bothered me because you're not going to blow people out most of the time. These games are going to be one possession games and the management of the game a lot of times determines the outcome. And I thought we saw the good Kyle last week against the Cowboys in that second half because you saw the running game start to pick up steam and you saw the Niners take time off the clock. Their first touchdown drive of the second half was 10 plays, 91 yards, six minutes. The drive after that was 13 plays, took up eight minutes in the game. So that's 14 minutes. That's essentially a quarter in the second half that the Niners had the football for. And you could tell by the way, Kyle was calling plays and runs that he was thinking that he was recognizing the value in taking up that time on the clock. So He's great at some management parts of the game. Just the end of that first half is like a bugaboo for him. Well, that 13 play drive where they just held the ball for so long. I think that was the turning point when the Niners physicality started to overpower and the Cowboys started to wear down because that's when they really just started. They ran, ran it up the gut a lot on that drive. You know, they were doing inside runs and the Cowboys couldn't match them. And that was the turning point. I think that's when, Kyle kind of, you know, he smelled the blood in the water that we got him now. We're going to be able to get five yards every single time. So we're just going to keep punching them. I don't think that's going to happen against the Eagles, though, because I don't think the Eagles are going to wear down like the Cowboys did. No, I don't think they will either. I I don't. It's difficult because on paper, if you just look at what the Eagles have been good at and what they haven't been good at, you're going to want to run. You're going to want an NFC championship game for, um, you know, 2019. Yeah, 2019, three years ago. You're, you're going to want to just keep pounding the rock because that's where they're weak. I think they were 21st against the run. And all of their losses, which this is a little bit of a uh, BS statistic, but in all of their losses, they gave up a lot of rushing yards. Well, I mean, you give up rushing yards when you're losing, but you know what I mean. That's why <laughs> it's kind of a BS statistic, but that that's, I think, how you beat them. is You control the clock, and you just keep running the ball, and you wear them down, and you keep running. And you just don't give them the ball because they are a high powered offense. And by the way, they attempt to do the other, the same thing on the other side of the ball. Yep. But Jalen Hurts is scrambling. Miles Sanders being a great running back this year. They control the ball. It's going to be, it's going to, I think it's going to be such like a heavyweight fight. Like if you thought Philly Dallas was physical, this is going to go to a whole other level this week. When the Eagles do have the ball, I saw a really interesting stat from Akash, our former co-worker at SB Nation That's weird. That's weird when we say. were there. I know it is. Um, Brock Purdy, under pressure, has an 88.1 passer rating. That's number four in the NFL. Jalen Hurts, under pressure, the mobile quarterback, Jalen Hurts, right, who can run everywhere, his passer rating under pressure is 65.2. That's number 20. In the NFL. Now, I know the Eagles have a very good defensive line, but if D'Amico can get a little bit creative, I wonder if the Niners can get a little pressure on Jalen and then potentially force a turnover or at least stall out some of these Eagles drives. Uh, that's somewhat of a misleading statistic, too. Uh, when Don't you're a mobile, you're pooing. I, I am. When you're a mobile quarterback on the level of Jalen Hurts, your passer rating against pressure is going to be a little bit worse because all those rushes, all those scrambles don't count. So the only passes you have are a lot of times when he wants to run, realizes he's not going to get away and he's forcing something. Could be. 
Uh, that that does factor into it. All right. So great. Okay. So blue, you can say it. I made a good point. <laughs> sort of. Let's even if you give them ten extra points on the passer rating, right? That's still seventy five point two. That's still not a very good passer rating at all. I'm just saying I'm surprised that it drops off that much considering you would think that he would be able to extend plays and find, you know, open right. windows and, and have a good rating under pressure. The key's going to be contained. They can keep him in that pocket and get the pressure. Maybe he struggles. If they can't keep contained, it, it's going to be, you know, Justin Fields running for daylight again. But this time I, it's hurts because those two are very similar in my mind. I feel like when the Niners get into trouble, most of the time, with quarterback scrambles, it's not quarterbacks getting to the edge. It was with Fields in week one a little bit, but that was a crazy game. He's a Usually, different class. Yes, that's true. Usually I feel like when they get in trouble, and we saw it in the Cowboys game on that fourth down play, they come full bore for the quarterback. Usually the defensive ends rush deeper than the quarterback's drop, which is always a recipe for disaster, and the quarterback has free reign to just step up in the pocket and run right up the gut and everybody's gone because everybody else is covering receivers down the field and they're just green grass. Part of it is the Niners like to run stunts, especially in pass rush situations. Yep. And what that does is it overloads one side. While if the quarterback can get out, go up through the middle to the side that they did the stunt from, well, now there's daylight. And what do they do with their linebackers, what you're talking about there? The Niners linebackers are in coverage because they're the best in the league at it. So a lot of times they're not there. You know, you're not having spies because Fred Warner is as good in coverage as a safety is. Greenlaws is is as good in coverage as a safety is. So you want them actually covering, but that means that there there's a void there. If he's able to step up and you have a stunt like that where you create an extra extra big gap for him to come up through the middle, there there will be daylight. Yeah, the rule for a quarterback is if they blitz you throw to replace the blitz throw to wherever that blitzer right. came from it's the same thing in this situation just run wherever the guy stunted from and there should be a, a lane for you it'll be interesting to see if D'Amico changes that at all this week does he leave Greenlaw to sort of spy Jalen Hurts does he change it up I almost feel like no I feel like D'Amico doesn't really change that much for anybody he, he throws in some things week to week but generally it's more like this is what we do we're just going to execute it at an extremely high level well, I did see a breakdown. I think it was Baldinger that did it, uh, Brian Baldinger. But he was talking about what it does when uh, they do the, the do the um, the thing where they have Greenlaw and Warner up on the line, acting like they're going to be blitzers. What that does is the offensive line must account for them, so they have to slide their protections for that. Because if they do blitz and you don't slide protection, you got a free runner at the quarterback, and so they have to slide protection. But then. More often than not, they just bail and go into coverage, and they're able to do that, unlike other linebackers, because they are so fast and so good in coverage that they are not behind. We saw that with Fred Warner and the C.D. Lamb play deep down the field. You know, there might be another linebacker in the league that would have been able to do that, and that's a big time might. Fred Warner's probably <laughs> the only one that that is capable of being on the line of scrimmage and beating a wide receiver like C.D. Lamb down the field. You know, he didn't get a he didn't uh, get a head start like he normally does, normally like a, a linebacker does. And that changes things because they can fake a blitz all the way up until the snap of the ball and still get back in coverage. And so that makes the offensive line uh, account for them. And it also makes the quarterback not know where he can go to the with the ball. So he has to wait until the snap happens and see where those linebackers actually go and whether or not they're blitzing to know. Normally when there's a blitz, they know pre-snap, okay, blitz is here. I'm going here. It's a hot route. They can't do that with these guys. And the I can't find the stat. I'm looking for it. But there was another stat basically that said when Jalen Hurts has to hold the ball for longer than a couple seconds, his passer rating also goes way down. He really gets the ball out of his hands quick. They do a lot of RPO stuff with him. And he's very good at, like you said, kind of making that snap read and then getting the ball where it needs to go. So if the Niners can delay that a little bit, that could make a world of difference too. Cause that's essentially what you got to do, right? You got to force him to play left-handed for lack of a better term, make him constantly have to do the thing he's uncomfortable with doing. So if you make him hold the ball and you get him under pressure a little bit, that's going to be your path to victory. And the Niners can do that. It's not like a, you know, a pipe pie in the sky dream here. Like that very well could happen on Sunday. 
there is one key area of the field that they could make Jalen Hurts have to do things that he's uncomfortable with, and that's the red zone. These were the stats that kind of stood out to me when I was looking up statistics uh, prior to us recording. Their red zone statistics are kind of odd because they're extremely efficient in the red zone. I think they were fourth in the league in terms of percentage of turning a red zone trip into a touchdown, over 60% on that. Wow. But it wasn't Jalen Hurts passing. Jalen Hurts only had 48 attempts in the red zone all year. He only had nine touchdowns in the red zone all year. He had more rushing touchdowns oh, in yeah. the red zone than passing. It's insane. But then you also had Sanders. Sanders had double-digit rushing touchdowns in the red zone as well. They're very good at using Hertz's rushing ability along with just generally running with Sanders and the other running backs. There were, I think, two other running backs that had double-digit carries in the red zone this year for the Eagles. They love to run in the red zone. The reason why they might be able to force Hertz in an uncomfortable situation is the Niners are best in the league at shutting down the run, and they're extremely good at doing it in the red or in the red zone because we've seen multiple goal line stands where they don't allow the touchdown. So Hertz might have to pass more than he wants. Which, by the way, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo had more completions in the red zone this year than Hertz. Jeez, <laughs> that's crazy. I yeah. think he only played half the season. Hertz was only twenty four or forty eight in the red zone. Terrible, only fifty percent. To put that. In a, in, uh, a comparison, Jimmy Garoppolo was over 60%, and Purdy is almost 75% in the red zone for completion. Hertz is not good at passing in the red zone. And I almost wonder if Sirianni kind of, for lack of a better term, Shanahan's in that situation, right? Let's take the ball out of Jalen's hands as a passer. Let's simplify things. Let's lower our risk because it's far less likely that we're going to turn the ball over if we run it. And because of Hertz's just rushing ability, like you said, he opens up things not only for himself, but also for Sanders or whoever's carrying the ball back there. So I wonder if he's just like, why do that? It was kind of like the Niners, right? Last year with Debo. Oh, we're getting the red zone. Just hand it to Debo. We don't, we don't want to do this passing thing. Just give it to Debo and we'll be fine. I, I wonder if that's the same thing with the Eagles. And that'll be an interesting thing too. Do the 49ers force him to pass? And then how does he do in those situations? Yeah, that's going to be a lot of, I think, one-on-one there. That's going to be where A.J. Brown can hurt you because he's so physical. You really got to watch Goddard in those situations. He's been a very good tight end this year, receiving-wise. I think he had over 700 yards. So you just got to be really careful with him. Can I just say something quickly? Because I feel like there's a lot of Eagles fans out there that every time you bring up Dallas Goddard, they say, oh, you know, he's just (laughs) as good as George K. No, he's not. Okay, no, yeah, he's not. Close. And I like Dallas Goddard. I do. He ain't George Kittle. He's just not. He's a fine player. He's a fine tight end. He ain't George Kittle. And I almost wonder if Kittle is going to come out with a little like, oh, all right, we're talking up, we're talking up Dallas Goddard, huh? I'll show you. I got something for you. I mean, he, he's you saw that thirty yard catch that he had last week, that bobbling catch. Did you see Next Gen Stats put out a number? He traveled. 14 yards from when the ball first hit his hand to when he actually secured it for the catch. That's half the distance of the entire reception. Did you see my tweet about that? Uh, no. It was so perfect. They found a Texas, (laughs) they found a Texas sized hole in the defense. Get it. Wow. (laughs) Levin. Did you come up with that all by yourself? You want to, you want another uh, pun? No. The Niners have a chance to beat Dallas twice. In two weeks, because they can beat Dallas Goddard. Oh, God. <laughs> First of all, I hate puns. Second, <laughs> everybody telling a pun has that same oh, yeah. stupid grin on their face. And you know what's beautiful? You know what's beautiful? This time, people are going to get to see it, because it's going to be on YouTube. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, You said that tweet was perfect. Perfect? I think that word does not mean what you think it means. <laughs> I don't even know where to go from here. I honestly don't know where to go. Did you have any other statistic or nugget or anything you wanted to throw out about the game coming up? No, but you can keep talking. I might think of another pun. Yeah, sure. Just carry the show for me <laughs> and you'll chime in when the lightning strikes and you actually think of something good to say. All right, well, let's go to predictions then. What is your official prediction for the game? You got a coin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, 
this is one I, I hate making a prediction on. I will. Uh, and I'm going to pick the Niners because, like I said, it's a coin flip. But I, I don't think anybody gets any credit for correctly predicting this game because nobody knows what's going to happen. Because it is not only, like I said, the two heavyweights, but it's two heavyweights who have never fought. Neither one of them know what to expect from each other. Nobody knows the adjustments. You know, there was Niner, no, Niner fans know big heavyweight fight in, in the NFC Championship. Seahawks versus the Niners, you know, 10 years oh. ago or so. That was a huge heavyweight fight. I think these two teams are pretty on par. They're, they're two teams without any glaring hole. And they're going to go at it. But the difference is, is those were divisional teams that knew each other extremely well. These yeah. two teams don't know each other. They played last year. The Eagles are nothing like last year. The quarterbacks are on a different court or the Niners are on a different quarterback. You know, the two teams are not very similar to what they were last year. A lot of people might think the Niners are defensively. They probably are offensively. I don't think the Niners are not with no. Christian McCaffrey and Purdy and just the changes from that. Yeah, I agree with you. And especially Purdy with Kittle. It, it is a different team just because of the way Purdy sees the field. I would advise you, Brock, if you're happen to be viewing this or listening to this, don't turn the ball over three times in the fourth quarter like Colin Kaepernick did against the Seahawks in 2013. Just, you know, yeah. small piece of advice from me. You know, just a pod, a humble podcaster. So, you know, just take it with a grain of salt, I guess. But that you're a YouTuber to now, go. too. That's true. Um, but I'll go 24 21 49ers. I think gold makes a field goal to, to be the difference. As much as I'd like to pick the Niners, and I would like to pick them, I did pick the Eagles to make the Super Bowl before the year started. I had Eagles-Ravens, so look great on one side, look terrible on the other. Um, I think the Eagles are going to win. Um, it's going to be close. I don't think it's going to be a blowout, but they just have too much. They are like the team I think the Niners wanted to be with Trey Lance. I really think that the Niners wanted their Trey Lance offense to look very similar to this Eagles offense. And I just think that between the defensive line being able to get pressure from multiple places rather than just one like the Niners have, it's going to be a small play like that here or there that's going to swing it. I'm going to go 28-21 Eagles. And it pains me to say that because for many reasons, I am hoping for a 49ers win this week. I just... I don't know if they're going to be able to pull this one off, especially on the road. I mean, it, the Eagles definitely have the defensive line the Niners wanted. That's why the Niners kept taking defensive linemen in yeah. every draft. They wanted a starting four that were each one of them dominant. Well, they got a starting four that each one of them had 10 plus sacks this year. The Niners, I think they have the depth advantage. The uh, Eagles have just the starting four, I think, is better. If you told me pick the starting defensive line, I'm taking the Eagles. The Niners have the best player, but the Eagles have the better starting defensive line, but the Niners have the better depth. So it's one of those things that it depends on what you value. I would take the Eagles' defensive line. I would take the Eagles' secondary. I would take the Niners' linebackers by a mile. There's a big gap there for sure. Yeah, and I mean, if you want to break up the secondary and say safeties and corners, corners – definitely go to the Eagles oh, safeties yeah. I think I think safeties are potentially a, a small advantage for the 49ers I think that's pretty close you know I did a podcast with RJ Ochoa who runs the SB Nation Cowboys community last week and he asked me if I could pick one player from the defense other than Bosa to have like an A plus game who would I pick and I picked Hufanga and what my explanation was like he can literally swing a game when he's making plays that he's capable of making oh, out he there. Can, he can swing it both ways. Right. But that's why I, <laughs> I want the A-plus Hufanga, and I think right. he could do the same in this game. You know, there could be a play where, you know, he just, that nose twitches before the play, and he's like, I think something's <laughs> up, and he abandons his responsibility, no, no. like he it's did not, against the Rams. And not got nose, it's the hair. <laughs> that's the, true. The, the hair, hair blows in the wind and whispers <laughs> the answer. <laughs> I feel like something is up. <laughs> I'm going to make a play here, um, but you're right. It could be good or bad because, you know, you know, there's going to be a play just like we saw earlier in the year uh, with the Raiders, right? Where the quarterback rolls out of the pocket and Hufanga is in that kind of no man's land where he can either yeah. he's close enough where he can try to sack the quarterback or stop him on an early scramble. But he's also deep enough where he can get back in coverage. And, you know, despite what he says, He's going to take the cheese and he's going to try and sack the quarterback and leave somebody open down the field. 
Uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's hope we get the difference maker. I, I would love to see him get, you know, like he had this last week where he just knows the snap comes flying oh, up on a blitz. But awesome. this time he get, he gets the fumble. You know what I mean? Like th- this last play or this last week, he had to choose. He didn't know where the ball was because the way the running back went, I think he couldn't tell if it was handed off or not. And he just picked one and ended up not being the person with the ball. But they still got a tackle for a loss. I would love to see him be able to get that where the quarterback Finish. is actually passing. Yeah. You could see it. You could see those plays before they happen because he takes those teeny tiny little steps right as he gets to the line of scrimmage. Oh, oh. There, goes, there goes the drawing that my son. That made better not game. be an omen. <laughs> uh, well, both helmets are on it, so we don't know good or bad. But um, you could see him like when he's going to come and he's. He's on it, man. It's unreal. He doesn't always get home. Sometimes he gets a block. Like you said, Dak broke the tackle this time, but he gets through immediately. It's awesome. Yeah. I would love to be able to get an honest answer from offensive linemen, quarterback, running back, all of them. When they see him start creeping up like that, they know the play call. They got to be going, oh, crap. Because <laughs> it's too late to bail. You know, it's too late to stop. You know, the, the offensive line's already set. They can't do anything about it. But you got to know, you know, the the, the uh, offensive tackle on that side has to see him coming and going, yep. crap, I'm screwed. Well, and it might shift who's responsible for who, just having his presence up there alone. And if one lineman misses it or just isn't fast enough or whatever, the protection's going to break down. So I love it. They don't do it all the time. They kind of pick their spots with it, but hopefully we see it this week. And hopefully, like you said, we get a turnover, fumble, interception, whatever the case may be. But man, this is going to be so, so much fun. And we are so grateful that so many of you have chosen to continue the journey with us. We really, really appreciate it. We're going to have tons of content for you on the YouTube page. All of our shows are going to have video components now. So they'll all be up on the YouTube page. If that's how you consume your podcast, now to be up. Gold Standard Podcast Network on Spotify. If you search Gold Standard 49ers, it comes right up. Please subscribe. We'll have audio podcasts for you. I'm going to try and get as many big name guests as I can in the next week to come on here and talk a little Niners for you. So it is the perfect time. Come in on the ground floor with us, and we will promise to continue to earn your time. And Levin, thank you especially for making this journey with me. Yeah, I'm here. (laughs) You're welcome. You already got one big name, right? You got me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> me and my sure. uh, 1,700 Twitter followers. You <laughs> hey, got them all. That's an increase. At you know what, takes that, by you, 11. Well, that is true. It has actually jumped quite a bit since you got laid off. So I guess <laughs> you're has welcome. Has that happened more often? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Jerk. I, <laughs> I would love to see how many of the Twitter followers I have are also following the Gold Standard Podcast because I would bet it's like 99%. <laughs> well, you should also follow that at GS Podcasts. Follow us there. Follow us everywhere. We are going to be putting out tons of content for you. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank want you another to- DeSorono. Ooh, At least yeah, that, one more this year. A celebratory DeSorono? I got to get another bottle if we win after this week for the Super Bowl. And so be you know what? After this. Shame on me. Shout out to Homage as well who not only has sponsored us when I was with Niners Nation and SB Nation, but they have already agreed to come on board and sponsor us here. And that is awesome. And I really appreciate them. So if you want to support us and support this show, go to homage. I'll have a link in the description for the show notes. You can click right there. They got tons of awesome 49ers stuff, but they also have a ton of other stuff. If you don't, if you've got enough 49ers gear or whatever, they have pop culture, video games, movies, tons and tons of awesome just cool stuff that you don't see everywhere else so thank you to homage because they're one of a uh, kind they, yes like that that's the one plug i'll say they are one of a kind every one of their shirts are truly unique they have things that like mimic the old nfl blitz i think you might have that one yep you know i think i think your victory mondays from them you know they have unique shirts that you don't find elsewhere so it's not like oh, I'm going to go on to one of these other sites and they have everything that the 49ers official store has and it's just a different site. No, this is all unique stuff. So go homage.com, H-O-M-A-G-E.com. Go and check it out. And of course, we're going to have Michelle is going to join us on Friday for the Gold Diggers podcast and we'll have the Instant Reaction podcast after the game. 
on uh, YouTube, my personal YouTube page at Stats on Fire, my Twitch page at Stats on Fire, Facebook at Stats on Fire. Basically, just search for that and you will get our instant reaction after the game. So it is going to be a ton of fun. Let's keep this winning streak going. I want 13 straight wins and hopefully we are all celebrating on Sunday night.